I'm on a journey to get better in all areas of life, from wellness and mental health to career and relationships and so much more. I know getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when you can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menunos. Hey guys. All right. Here we are again, trying out a fun idea that we're calling the Better Together series. So for the next two weeks, we're going to focus on a specific topic or theme of the week like we did last week. This week's theme is mental health and spirituality, where some of the world's leading experts and healers teach you invaluable tools and strategies that alleviate anxiety, depression, PTSD, and so much more. Be sure to let us know what you guys think. Hope you guys are loving it. And if you're not, tell us anyway. We want to be better and we're only better together, right? Uh, Share it with a friend who could benefit and enjoy. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's what we try to do here every single day. Our quote of the day, you are not rewarded for the comfortable choice. Oh, shit. This is going to be a tough interview, guys. Aubrey Marcus. (laughs) Own the day, master 24 hours, master your life. He is our guest today. He's a human optimization expert, on it founder, and he's going to discuss how to start our 2021 off with focus, fitness, and holistic living. You are not rewarded for the comfortable choice. Balls. I read that quote last night and lost my mind. Well, here's the thing. I was in the shower this morning, and if you know anything about Aubrey uh, Marcus, you know that he... um, you know, this is what he does. And, you know, he's kind of a blend of a lot of different people that we, you know, know and love. And, um, you know, everyone has their unique approach and he has his, but we were in bed last night and I was doing some research and he was talking about trying to train yourself to do hard things basically. And one of the ways to do it is to take cold showers and the cold shower is really healthy for you and has so many incredible benefits, which is an aside. The point of it is it's forcing you to do something extremely uncomfortable, something that you don't want to do. And I just looked at Kevin and I started laughing because I know Kevin, it's scorching hot. It's not just warm or even hot. It is scorching hot. His skin is turning beet red in the shower. And kind of looked at me and goes, oh, shit. <laughs> right, honey? What was your reaction? Yeah, so I was like, no, I don't really want to do the cold shower. But then he was saying all the benefits, which I know, but man, really? Mm-hmm. I do it. Of the, uh, you do? Do you really count? Yes, Dr. Lippman taught us a cold rinse. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a long shower, but I always, I have, honestly, for a long time, cold rinse, just quick, it wakes you up little. Ooh. So that's an example of like me hearing Dr. Lippman doing it for a couple of days. I did do it for a couple of days. I would, you know, and it's really good for your hair too. Exactly. Um, and then that just kind of faded away. Jeff. It's a, I was going to say it's out of the Tony Robbins playbook too. You know, he mm-hmm. does those cold plunges every day. I like ice baths after I run, um, but I don't really take cold showers. So can you but explain be- how Jeff Graham does an ice bath? Like, are you doing these in the Midwest right now? Yeah, actually, it's easier here because there's a bigger tub (laughs) in my little apartment in L.A. But so what do you do? So I'll just turn only the cold water on and then get like maybe three cups worth of ice. So it's not like frigid ice, cold ice, but it's cold enough. Kevin's laughing. Why are you laughing? Because who's greater than Jeff Graham? We've been introduced (laughs) to slow coffee. Now the Midwest ice bath. I I just <laughs> specifically it's the amazing, Midwest. Amazing, Jeff. Your life is just <laughs> the best. Wait, I've got my routines. So I we renovated um, and I got a new tub out of the deal, and I've never had a tub all these years in my bathroom. Ever? Never, no. Oh, it's the best thing in the world. No, I know. Trust it's me. How I shop for apartments. My Maria. bathroom was from <laughs> 1981, and not not nice. Everything was falling apart. Anyway, so I got this beautiful, like big soaking tub, but I don't envision myself putting a couple cups of ice in there ever. Um, although when I go, if I've gone to like, you know, a spa, they do have like the hot bath and the, you know, the hot tub and then the cold plunge. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that environment and I go on the sauna, I'll do all of it. And it is, it does feel great. There are moments when here we'll jump from our, you know, we have a hot tub outside. We'll jump from that into the pool and it feels really refreshing. So I do like it. 
But I was having a conversation with myself and like Aubrey in my head this morning in the shower. And I was like, yeah, no, I just, I'm really disciplined and I can do hard things and I do hard things a lot. So I don't think this is an exercise I necessarily have to do to prove to myself I can do hard things. I'm going to enjoy my warm shower because sometimes life is about the Good pleasures. Point. Good point. Right. I, well, <clears throat> and think of the like the, this and think of the pleasure of a hot shower. It's not like smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not like drinking wine, you know, to excess. It's, you know, so for me, I don't do well in the cold. I I worked in the carny business outdoors, sometimes 105 degrees. Everyone would tip, not me. But you put me in the cold. I'm not very good. I, I'm like even in athletics. Just I'm not. I was never good in the cold. I'm a I'm a heat guy. And I, See, I, don't know, I just don't like it. But but I so I like a really hot shower that gets me going in the morning and whatever. But I see the. I see the benefits. <laughs> I'm shocked, you guys. I honestly don't find it that hard. I'm like you, Kev. I hate, like, despise the cold. But you start hot, and then just last minute, you're like, okay, got to do it. Key little 30-second rinse. Okay. Uh, you know what? Don't see ya. I, I I agree with that, and I like that. I mean, I've done cryotherapy, and I can hang with the big boys, although the boys generally can't hang. It's the women that hang. Just a fun fact for you all. No, it's so Always. true. I just jump right out of that thing. Is I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, we got to get to our interview because we are very, very late. So, guys, Aubrey Marcus is the founder and CEO of On It, a lifestyle brand based on a holistic health philosophy he calls total human optimization. Um, he has optimized millions of lives, including many top professional athletes. He's currently hosting the Aubrey Marcus podcast, a motivational destination for conversations with the brightest minds in athletics, business, science, relationships, and spirituality with over 35 million downloads on iTunes. As we enter a new year, there's obviously never been a better time to optimize our lives and Aubrey is going to help us get there. So without further ado, do we have Aubrey? There he is. There he is all the way from Costa Rica. (laughs) How are you? How's it going? I'm great. So how long have you been in Costa Rica? About five days now. How long are you going to be there for? About 25 more days. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Wow. What are you doing there? Just vacationing? A little bit of that. And uh, we have an ayahuasca retreat on the 17th through the 24th. So just thought we would explore this uh, this country here. I'm actually thinking about getting a place out here at some point. Wow. Have you ever been? I have. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I went there a long time. Actually, I went there when I graduated high school and we stayed at the base of the volcano Arenal. It's so nice. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we're staying there after uh, after the retreat in the hot springs. It's unbelievable. So cool. Um, Wow. Well, I'm I'm amazed at our wonderful connection, which is so good. (laughs) I know. I was really happy about that, too. Yeah. Not real quick, Maria. I just have to quickly jump in because, Aubrey, I'm fascinated by the ayahuasca thing. And we're going to dive in and I'm going to let Maria take the reins. But my wife and I are very straight-laced Midwesterners. But we have kind of jokingly teased that maybe we would try it. No way. Before before we <laughs> dive in, have you have you done a retreat before? And can you speak to kind of what it is for our listeners who don't know? Because the thing is with our show, we try to present as many kind of options for life experiences as we can. And we let our audience choose what they want to put in their tool belt. Yeah, I mean, I started on the, you know, traditional psychedelic medicine journey uh, 21 years ago. And I went on a traditional vision quest uh, with psilocybin mushrooms out in the mountains with a with a shaman, and that was really what changed you know my whole perspective on life. At that point, um, you know, I came in and I had no spiritual I had no spiritual background at all, and I really didn't believe in anything spiritual. I was very much kind of a materialist scientist uh, as far as my perspective, and then I just felt my whole body evaporate and realized that there was something that you could call consciousness or you could call a soul or something that was separate from my physical form and my mind. And that's really what started me on the journey. And, you know, I've had ayahuasca uh, 14 times now by this point. And every time is dramatically different, you know, putting you face to face with some of your, you know, deepest fears that you need to confront, uh, giving you kind of wisdom and guidance from what feels like uh, intelligence that's outside of your own, mind and your own capability and it's uh it's been a pretty amazing journey i mean ayahuasca is 
they call it the you know the vine of the soul or the vine of death for a reason because it's it's quite intense and typically puts you face to face with that thing that you're the most scared of uh, in your life. Hey, Hill Squad and Better Together fam. It's been a tough year, but we hear from so many of you just how much our content is helping you heal and get better, and it makes us feel so good. Our team works so hard to deliver this life-changing content, and a lot of you guys ask, how can I have a bigger role in our Heal Squad community, or how can I do my part to help Better Together continue to uplift even more people? First of all, thank you for that sentiment, and we're so grateful for this community. If you could help us by giving us a five-star rating, rating and a comment on Apple Podcasts. That's amazing. Second, you could join the Better Together with Maria Menuno's Facebook group and Instagram page. Third, you could share the show with a friend in need. And finally, for as little as $10 a month, please join our Patreon to get monthly live heal events with world-class healers, ad-free episodes of our show, and even weekly bonus episodes exclusive to Patreon. Getting better isn't easy, but it is a whole lot better when we can do it together. We love and appreciate and are so grateful for all of you. Sounds terrifying. (laughs) It can be. Yeah, it can be for sure. It can also be absolutely beautiful and exhilarating too. Well, it sounds beautiful. I mean, if you can have an experience where you feel your soul, right? Like, it's not something you can put your finger on in normal life, right? Or like under normal kind of auspices. So if there's a way where you can kind of feel that, like, how did you, how did you kind of feel that touch that? How did that? You're on, you're on the exact right thread, right? Because the, the best analogy I like to use would be taking someone who's never had an avocado before ever. And being like, look, I'm telling you about this avocado. It's got this like little rough skin and you dive in and it's so soft and it squishes in your mouth. And it has this really like, how do you describe it? You can't like that person may have an idea of what it is, but they won't ever really know what it is until they taste it. Until they, you know, have a spoon or a bite or some guacamole or some avocado toast, whatever. They're never Mm going to know what an avocado is. And you're never really going to know what the soul is. You're never going to know what God is until you feel it, until you actually have that, you know, sensation. The Greeks called it gnosis. It's a knowing that's beyond the mind. It's like a physical somatic knowing and experience of what that is. And that's what the the plant medicine journeys have given me access to. And I'm forever, forever grateful for it because it's ultimately ineffable. It's hard to describe what that is because we don't have a lexicon and even words that make sense to describe it. It's not relatable in that mm-hmm. way. So um, that's one of the challenges of it, but it's, it's a feeling of ultimate, you know, liberation. Honestly, it's feeling really free and clear. And, you know, with this kind of joyful understanding of this crazy thing that we're in, in polarity with our regular life. And you can just see it from a different perspective and feel absolutely safe and held and, as your, you know, unborn, undying, eternal identity, which isn't subject to all of the waves of polarity that we experience here in life. So would you say, so you did this 20 years ago, you started, where was your life when you started it? And what changed after? Like, cause I imagine when you have an awakening, um, you know, you see things differently, your life takes different paths, your career, your choices. So if you can explain that, and then I want to kind of go into the kind of nitty gritty of what it is and how you go about yeah, doing sure. it the right way for people who might be interested. Cause I know my husband almost did it at one point too. I'm yeah. terrified. I can't be <laughs> altered. I can't be out of control. It's just too scary. The only times I ever did marijuana, it was the worst experience ever. I can't do it. I'm terrified. And so, and I remember watching in college, our psych teacher or something gave us a video of what it was like to trip on acid. So we had to watch a video of what the experience would feel like. And I was throwing up in the chair just looking at this. So I was like, I am not for drugs. Drugs are not for me. Goodbye. So carry on. <laughs> yeah. 
A couple of things to a couple of things to say on that. And obviously every choice is absolutely valid. You shouldn't do this if you feel compelled or if you feel pressured, if you're not sure. You have to go into this saying that I'm ready. And mm-hmm. that's like the most important thing that I could say because there will come up, there will there'll be things that come up that will be challenging. And if you didn't choose it with your own volition and your own absolute commitment, you're gonna be like, What the hell did I do? And you'll get stuck in that loop there. But a couple of things to comment on. One. People think that because cannabis is legal and because everybody kind of it's their first thing that it's the easy psychedelic. It's not. It's not. I've done every psychedelic in the world. And I can tell you some of the most challenging experiences I've ever had is when I ate too much cannabis. (laughs) Like hands down, that's some of the most difficult things to navigate. Okay, so not nuts. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. So that's one thing I tell everybody, because that's something I hear all the time. Well, I had, you know, I had this cookie and it was had more weed in it than I thought. And it was a really hard experience. I was like, yeah, that's the hardest. Like you really, you really did it. There's ayahuasca and then there's too much cannabis and too much cannabis (laughs) to me is like way harder than purging it, you know, into a bucket. I'm glad you said that though, because it gives us like, um, kind of a scale, right? Like, I, I'm horrified, terrified of ayahuasca because I hear people throwing up and I'm like, oh gosh, I can't throw up. I have the flu and I'm going to hold the vomit in because I'm I, that sensation is so scary to me of throwing up. So I hear ayahuasca and vomiting. I'm like, oh, hell no, not for me. But I like that you're giving me a scale because there are things about it that are interesting to me, but all of the other stuff just scares me so much. So I, I like the scale of like, okay, no, the marijuana is worse. So, okay, carry on. Yeah, this is fun. I, I absolutely think so. And as far as being out of control, that's another huge fear, right? That's a, that's a massive fear. What oftentimes you will find, which is going to be a lot different than that video that your psych teacher showed you, because I guarantee you can't capture a psychedelic experience with the video. There's been people, amazing people who've tried and it's it's just impossible. Because the the thing that you can often experience is almost a hyper sobriety, the realization that you're not out of control, that your whole life you've been out of control because you've been blind by your unconscious and subconscious urges and processes and your addictions to these endogenous neurochemicals, the feelings of drama, the feelings of chaos, the feelings of stress, the feelings of all of these things are parts of your addictions that you're not even aware of and your Oof. compulsions. And so you take some of these medicines and you all of a sudden get sober for the first time in your life. And you're like, wow, look at all of the ways that I haven't been free. Look at all of the ways that I've been compelled to live the way that I have. And now I can see them all and I actually have agency. And it's this beautiful place of I'm finally in control, actually. And so it's really often the opposite where you actually think you're going to lose control, but really you gain control because that part of you that's forever stable, your soul, if Mm -hmm. you will, the part that is the unborn, is the undying, is the higher aspect of yourself, that thing that whispers to you in the quiet and when and just urges you on, says, come on, you got this. Like, you know, you should go write that thing, speak that thing, say that thing, break up with that person. That part of you that's the most sober and has your back always is the part that you identify with and subsumes you and that's who you become. And so it's this kind of hyper sobriety and the sense of control like you've never had that allows you to navigate a lot of these different experiences. Now, that said, doesn't mean that you can't lose that. Doesn't mean that all of a sudden your ego self, your small self can freak the fuck out and be like, what's going on? I don't know what this is. This is too much for me. I'm not ready for this. You know, that can certainly happen as well. But typically, if you're with the right person and you're called to the medicine at the right time, you're going to get the former experience rather than the latter. But you have to be prepared for the latter. And that's why it has to be such a conscious choice. That's Mm -hmm. why you have to commit to it, because you have to know that this isn't, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And so you have to be ready for anything. So if you get in some deep, choppy water, you have to say, well, you know, I knew that the deep, choppy water was a was a possibility. And here I am. So let's go. Whoa. Okay. I guess the control part that is my concern is because my deepest, prob- probably my deepest, not probably, my deepest issues are um, not feeling safe. And so I would Hmm. never trust anyone to feel (laughs) safe in that environment alone. Cause I've just, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's, you would need to trust someone. So like, yeah. for example, one of the greatest, you know, one of the greatest medicine men that I ever worked with was his name was Don Howard. He recently passed and he was offering Wachuma, which is the San Pedro cactus as a Wachumero for over 50 years, done thousands of ceremonies. And he was like the wise Gandalf grandfather. And in his care, for example, you just absolutely knew from his 50 years of experience and his thousands upon thousands of ceremonies that he's led, that you're in absolutely the right place with the best person that could possibly navigate that. So there are situations that you can get in where I believe that you would, you would have that trust. You would feel it. Okay. You would just know it. You'd be like, all right, like I get it. This is Gandalf and I'm safe, <laughs> you know, but, but there's other situations where, yeah, it can get a little squirrely. You know from our show how many of us struggle with mental health today, but lack time, direction, and money to cope. That's why I'm excited to share Talkspace with you. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform that has thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and so much more. With Talkspace, you're able to access providers from your device 24-7, so therapy can be on your schedule. It's like having a therapist in your pocket at a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off of your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code BETTER to get $100 off of your first month and show your support for the show. That's BETTER and Talkspace.com. Let's keep healing together. Yeah, like I'm the girl who begged my parents to let me go on spring break. My cousin helped me like negotiate. They said yes. And then I was like, okay, cool. Now I don't want to go. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I just wanted to know I was allowed. And then I chose not to go because I didn't trust anybody to be like safe with. Like, I'm not going to go get drunk Uh with all these assholes who are going to like mess with me or do something bad or put me in a bad position or leave me in a bad position. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going. That's me. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So. And, you know, that's that's also for anybody who's in, you know, interested in this and going down this path. If you ever get into a situation, even if you prepaid up front and you're in a situation and it feels sketchy and you d- there's something, you know, there's something that's going off. Obviously, we're all going to have a little resistance. There's going to be a little feeling in our gut when we go dive off the other side of this psychedelic cliff. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's normal. But if you've sent something that's off with the provider or with the setting or with the people that you're going to be sitting with, pull out. Like there's always another time, you know, it's okay. You can either get your money back or the money's just gone. Don't worry about it. Like I always urge caution in those situations. Trust your gut, trust your instincts and only go if all, all you see are green lights. So can you, for the purposes of, of everyone who doesn't know what is ayahuasca and kind of how, what is involved in it? Since you're about to take people on this journey, is it through your company on it where you, you have a retreat going on? What is it? No, I'm actually just going. Uh, so I'm not actually facilitating or providing the retreat. I'm actually just joining a retreat. It happens to be with members of my, uh, this mastermind that I run because they open it up to that group as well as me. Um, but it's put on by this group called Soltara out here in Costa Rica. So I'm just going as a participant uh, with some people, some people I know, some people I don't. And uh, it's been about five years since I had ayahuasca last. And so we're going to show up and there's shamans that are brought in from Peru, from the Shipibo people who have a, you know, multi-generational, several thousand year tradition of serving ayahuasca. They've cultivated the songs and the relationships with the plants And what ayahuasca is, it's a combination of a vine and some leaves. And the leaves contain DMT. And DMT is one of the most potent psychoactive compounds in the world. But it's also in every living thing, in every plant, in every animal, there's DMT in there. And there's receptors in our brain that the DMT molecule fits in and, and locks into. And when that happens, there's a very intense psychedelic experience usually very visual and very somatic. The ayahuasca vine itself is what allows the DMT to be orally active because normally the body breaks it down. So no matter how many leaves you eat that contain DMT, you're not going to start tripping because you have something called monoamine oxidase in your system and it'll break it down 
and you won't actually have enough DMT in your system to experience um, the psychoactive effects. So the vine, it dampens, it's an inhibitor of the monoamine oxidase. So it allows the, all the leaves that have been brewed in there and all the DMT in these leaves to be psychoactive. And then you have this experience that lasts about five hours. The vine itself is purgative. So it's going to cause you to purge typically. Not everybody does, but you'll purge either vomit or out the other side or sometimes both at the same time. And, you know, this is part of the cleansing process of this. Um, but it's, uh, it's a wild experience and no two experiences are the same. Sometimes it's just very visual with colors and pattern, patterns and sacred geometry. Sometimes it's very, you know, visceral, remembering traumas, remembering, you know, challenging situations you had. I remember the first time I had a DMT experience, which wasn't ayahuasca. It was actually a, a snuff called Yopo. Um, there's many ways to get DMT. You can smoke it, snuff it, drink it. You know, there's all different ways and they have different durations. Ayahuasca is the longest duration. But I remember the first time I did it, there was none of these sacred geometry visuals. I was straight back to a very traumatic experience with my father when he got pretty enraged with me and was, you know, yelling. And I was a young kid. And, and I went back to that moment, absolutely back to that moment. And then I went back there, not just as my child self, but as my older self and got to repattern that fear that I felt and that helplessness and say, I'm here now and I'm a man now and you can't do this to me anymore. You know, you can't do this. And this was this, this Oof, really powerful that. moment where I was able to reclaim and take my power back, you know, in this vision. So that wasn't anything that was, it was just me diving straight back into my memories because I had to repattern that trauma and, and show up and, and reclaim my power. And so that was an experience I've had. And But are you consciously reprogramming? Are you going, like, is, is someone guiding you in that moment and saying, okay, where are you? This is what you should do now. Like, what, how, how does it work? I was back in, it happened in a hotel room. And I was back in the hotel room. And I was reliving the experience as my five-year-old self in the corner of the hotel room. Is my father was shouting at me and, like, trapping me in the corner of the room. And I remember, you know, it was, it's a, it was a tough experience. And I remember saying, dad, dad, you know, stop. I love you. I love you. Stop. And he just kept going. And it was a really tough experience at that point. So I went back straight to that and I was back as that little kid. And then I had a realization and I, and I have, you have some awareness that like I'm in an experience, but all the tears, all of the emotions, I mean, I'm really there viscerally there you know, and seeing it, I have a blindfold on, but I can still feel that I'm in a, you know, the grounds underneath. I, I, you have some awareness that this isn't real, real, that you're in a, you're in a vision, you're in, you're like in a movie, for example. So I was there and then I had the understanding that, oh, wait, I'm not that, I'm not that boy anymore. I'm a man now, you know, I'm a full grown man and I'm strong and I'm, you know, I'm no longer a child. And so I just stood up. And as I stood up staying in the same vision, I was able to say, you know, I'm a man now. You can't do this to me anymore. You know, like, don't you dare, don't you dare even try, you know? And it was this like really potent moment where I got to like really grow up and confront that aspect of my father. And I don't want to, you know, be unnecessarily hard on my father. We had a great relationship. You know, he had, some anger that would come out every now and then, but I wouldn't even say that it was an abusive relationship that I had with him, but there was just moments that were traumatic. And I mm -hmm. think we all have these traumatic moments and I got to really <clears throat> heal that traumatic moment. And I think there was, it was really a rite of passage for me. It was a place where I could confront my father in that and then establish that now I'm a man and that I don't think I would have ever been able to get that without like talking about it wouldn't have done it. Yeah. The greatest, you know, psychotherapist could have been like, okay, go back there and, you know, experience it. And now realize that you're a man. And I've been like, okay, yeah, I get it. But yeah. to actually be there and to see my father's response and to feel it and to feel how I was and to feel how I am now, that offered me the completion of that. And, you know, so these type of experiences are, in my opinion, unavailable 
from normal talk therapy. And it's what we're seeing pan out in the, in the research right now. I mean, right now, MDMA assisted psychotherapy is showing two out of three treatment resistant PTSD cases are getting cured from this, the combination of MDMA <clears throat> and three sessions of, you know, in that case, there are actually people who are helping talk you through. And then psilocybin is curing depression and anxiety at rates up to 80%, right? From a single, from a single dose. And what wow. we're seeing is this whole paradigm shift of what 20 years of, you know, 20 years of therapy might've been able to accomplish is now happening like that. And, and it's sticking. And in the follow-up studies, it's lasting and it's the cures, just like for me, that trauma with my father, I felt it completely evaporate wow. at that one point. Does again, caveat doesn't mean it's always going to happen, doesn't yeah. mean it's always going to work like this, but it has that potential to be a real catalyst for growth. So, how did you see your life change in the last 20 years since you started doing it? Like, what were like concrete things that you could share with somebody that, you know, I, I took my life in this way, I changed my business? Like, what, what changed for you? Well, I mean, I was still a kid when I started, you know, fresh out of high school. And as I said, I had no spiritual belief system at all, period. And I was actually really angry at religion because I was like, this is nonsense. Where's the scientific proof? Mm. You know, and I didn't, I had no faith. I had no belief system. And then I experienced this and I experienced what I could call my consciousness or my soul. And then I was like, oh, wow, I got to rethink this whole thing. And that drew me, it was like this thing that drew me on a path to really understand experientially my own beliefs about spirituality. So that I don't think that would have ever happened unless I had an experience that allowed me to feel it myself. So that was a massive shift. And then as I continued along the path with all of these different medicines, there's been a variety of tangible things that have happened in my first Iboga experience, which is a uh, African like tree shrub from Gabon, the bark of the tree. And I had that experience and I went down there with my fiance. And in that experience, I understood that we were actually meant to be great friends and not meant to get married. And I was about 28 at that point. And I argued with the, I argued with the, what felt like the spirit of the medicine for five hours. It's a very long experience, about 24 hours. I was like, come on. I was like, this is bullshit. Like, we're going to get married. And I was like, no, like, you're meant to be, you're meant to be best friends. And I was like, so I got out of that and I trusted it. And sure enough, you know, we're best friends now. And I'm married to, you know, the woman who I'm absolutely certain that I came here to, to be with and to, to be my partner. So it was absolutely correct as much as I didn't want to see it. And the woman that I was engaged to, Caitlin, is my best friend, like absolutely is my best friend and best friends to my wife as well. So that was like a beautiful thing that was very tangible, something that was unseen. Same with the starting of my business before. So I had started my business on it and I was making hangover supplements at the time. That's, those were actually the very first things and it wasn't working and it wasn't like, it wasn't clicking and it, and it just, I was trying, I exhausted all the money that I had in the company, which wasn't very much. I raised like a hundred thousand dollars and came up with these two different formulas and was trying to sell them and it was failing. And in the ayahuasca experience, it showed me what I was doing and what I could do to help make it work. And it was very like, I was like from everything from the packaging, the formulas, the type of formulas, the ingredients, and it was all information that I had available to me. It wasn't like showing me something that my mind couldn't comprehend, but it just was a total pivot. And that pivot worked, you know, and, and the company on it is, you know, a massive, massive company now and started a real movement. And um, maybe I would have come up with it on my own. Maybe not. I don't know, because I had that experience where I could see it and I saw it like a, like a heartbeat. And there was just all of these clogged, arteries and veins. And if I just straightened a few things out and shifted a little bit, the organism would be able to breathe and circulate. And um, so the hangover supplements were gone. I launched Alpha Brain and, uh, and on it, you know, and then everything else carried on from there. So 
it's a combination of spiritual understanding, you know, healing, uh, decisions about my life that I was unaware of. And, you know, and then ultimately in my last probably five years, it's really been a lot more about how to bring community together and how to be of service in the greatest way possible and really showed me, you know, a lot of details about this fellowship, the, the mastermind that I started called Fit for Service, and which has been probably the thing that I'm the most proud of in my life. And it really gave me a keen understanding of how to guide that and how to pull that together. And also just how to show up myself in the best way possible, how to make myself fit for service, just like the name of the, of the mastermind. So that's been kind of a, if you try to sum up 20 years of journeys, those are some of the things that it's brought, it's brought to me. So cool. Before we go on to my next question, how many people listening right now, (laughs) Kelsey, Kevin, Jeff, how many of you want to do ayahuasca now? (laughs) Right now. I'm, I, it was interesting because I'm like you, Maria. I, every time that I've like smoked or done any sort of marijuana, I freak out, Aubrey. I like literally, yeah, full blown panic attacks. Not yeah. well, not yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So I think I I thought a man in the movie theater was raping me. Yeah. I'm like, he's, well, he's, he yeah. want, he's going to rape me. He's going to yeah. rape me. And there was no man in the movie theater. It was just me and Kevin. And I'm like, no, that guy right there, he's coming. He's going to rape me. Like I am. It's so crazy. I yeah. can't stand it. No, yeah. that was me. That was me. So hearing you talk about this, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's fascinating. I'm like, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. You sold me. Kev. <laughs> I've wanted to for a long time and um, it just, you know, I've heard different things. I've heard some people do it and have gotten nothing out of it. You know, I wanted to get your take on that. Is that that maybe they weren't ready or they weren't with the right shaman? But I have had friends who've gone through it and like, eh, you know, I threw up a lot and I went through all that, but no, nah, didn't really do much. So ayahuasca is one of the most interesting medicines in that there are experiences that you have where nothing happens. Now, there's the metaphysical explanation of this, which is, you know, and this is what they always say, the medicine gave you exactly what you needed and you just needed this nothing experience. Maybe. Or maybe their receptors weren't working. Right. Or maybe something was going on in your biology that you weren't able to inhibit the monoamine oxidase. So the DMT was not available to be orally active. And so you didn't activate the experience. It could be either. I tend to, I tend to always, you know, say, all right, let's look at the, let's look at the biology and see what happens here. And, uh, and I think that's often the experience that happens and that depends. It also can depend on the brew, you know, depending on how much, cause this is not like they have beakers where they're measuring how much DMT and how much MAOI is going in there and that they actually can do that. That's called uh, like anawaska or pharmawaska where they actually can make uh, an analog to this. And that's actually really <laughs> kind of really sketchy um, because it's not done in this kind of traditional. So I don't recommend that at all, but you are reliably going to have an experience. But when you're brewing a tea, well, what was the rainfall on this particular plant? What was the sunlight? How much DMT was actually in the leaves? How about the vine itself? You know, what were the conditions in the soil? Like so many different factors make up what each batch of is because it's brewed from plants. So it could be a combination of the brew. It could be a combination of your, you know, physiology. Uh, It could be a variety of different things. So you have to be prepared for that experience as well. But typically, you know, the shamans with the most experience, they know how to, how to understand, like they can sense what leaves, what vine, what race, they can feel it. It's like a, they have a knowing about these because they actually, you know, they sing to the plants. They spend months in the jungle on what's called a dieta, where all they're doing is having little bites of these leaves and little bits of the bark and, and really connecting both spiritually and biologically with these plants. So you got to think of them as like the ultimate spiritual green thumb, you know, where they're out there in the wild cultivating it. So typically you'll get a more reliable, you know, dose from that. Um, from shamans who have that kind of relationship, but not always. And how do you find those? Had, how do you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how do you find those shamans? That's also a, that's also an issue. That's also <laughs> a challenge. Um, you know, a lot of times you have to talk to people who've experienced them 
you have to, you know, do your research, really like try and find as many people who've had a similar experience and, uh, and also trust your instincts. Um, you know, I've worked with several different shamans, all of which, you know, I've been very blessed. have been great. I've worked with also awful shamans for different medicines that have really created dangerous situations. And that can happen with ayahuasca shamans as well. So this is something it's very, it's very important. Uh, I have a lot of trust with the group that I'm going to Soltara in, uh, in Costa Rica here that they're, you know, I've had a lot of experience who's a lot of conversations with people who've gone and experienced their retreat, <clears throat> all been positive. And then the, people that I've worked with that are still active. There's a shaman named Maestro Alberto, who's out in Peru. And then at Spirit Quest Sanctuary, where my former spiritual mentor, Don Howard was, uh, Don Robert, Doña Eliana, are still offering ayahuasca retreats at Spirit Quest Sanctuary. So I've worked with both of them and I can speak, you know, of the, to their own impeccability, but, and also my very first shaman, he's still out in Peru as well, Maestro Orlando Chuendama. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's, uh, other than personal references and talking to people and just kind of getting immersed in it, um, it's, you know, you're, you're kind of taking some chances until you've really talked to somebody who's gone through it and somebody with some experience who really understands, uh, what's happening. Heel Squad, I may have my biggest discovery yet. If you're like me, you hate mattress shopping. You go lay on a million beds, end up dizzy and hungry, and just pick something because you're desperate. I've always gone home unhappy, but not anymore. Okay, I don't know why we didn't know about Sleep Number before. Maybe it was just me. But you go online, take a quiz, and you go into the store, and they use a high-tech mattress to discover your pressure points. It's actually a perfect process. Then they take your sleep number. Mine's 25. You lay on one or two beds that the quiz chose for you, and boom, you're done. And their beds are even more high-tech and mind-blowing than I have time to tell you right now, but just wait till you try. I almost cried. And my bed is temperature balancing, so my house doesn't have to be an igloo at night. And I have a foot heater. What is this? And if Kevin's snoring, I can raise his head with my controls. Mm-hmm. Trust me. Don't go anywhere else ever. Discover the Sleep Number 360 smart bed. Special offers for a limited time only at Sleep Number stores or sleepnumber.com backslash better. Trust me, guys. To all our entrepreneurial hill squatters out there who make products and crafts to sell online, have I got a tool for you. Introducing ShipStation, the service that makes it easy to manage your orders and get your products out the door. No matter how you sell, Shopify, Etsy, your own website even, ShipStation funnels all your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. With ShipStation, small businesses can now access the same rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without contracts or commitments. 100,000 plus online sellers choose ShipStation, making it the number one choice for you online sellers. You can ship more in less time and for a lot less money. Just use my offer code BETTER to get a 60 day free trial that's two months free of no hassle, stress free shipping. Just go to shipstation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in BETTER. That's shipstation.com. Enter the offer code BETTER and make ship happen. <laughs> Jeff, we haven't gone to you and your thoughts. I am so conflicted, Aubrey, just to speak candidly, because I'm a critical thinker. You know, I'm someone who likes to take in as much information as I can. And I will say you're the f one of the first people who's presented this in a way that would make me consider doing it. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I've been so enculturated to not. I've been so enculturated to be terrified by it. And I'm sure you can probably speak to like the industrial complex as to why that is. I'd be really curious to hear your take on that. Um, and I think the thing that would convince me is that everything is plant-based. This is all from the earth. Um, but I got to say the way I was raised, grown and taught, it's, it's scary to me. And I'd be curious mm. to hear if you would speak to, if there's institutional reasons why I feel that way. Well, there, there may be, you know, I mean, there's obviously one thing that we have to look at is the self-serving bias. And I like to think of corporations like entities, they have a spirit to themselves that all people are participating in and all corporations have a self-serving bias. And if unchecked and if there isn't guidance from the top down and from universally that there are things more important than profits, then profits are the food for corporations. And so 
you have to look, and this is no conspiracy. It's just the simple, simple nature of the self-serving bias, which is that you will look at information and read information and see information in the way that serves you in the best way. So you have to look at the pharmaceutical companies and say, all right, is this a grand conspiracy or are they just reading the information, understanding things in a way that is the most self-serving for them, for their profits, for their shareholders, et cetera. And of course they are. We all are. We all have self-serving bias. Nobody escapes it. You know, we'll all look at things and understand them in a way that is beneficial to what we actually want. So I do think that that's a factor, especially as we're looking at the research that's emerging on both psilocybin and MDMA, which can replace, you know, a host of different pharmaceutical interventions. So we have to take a look at that. And and especially in the the climate and landscape we're in, we just have to understand that self-serving bias is active. And when there's billions of dollars at play, you can be assured that 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 bias is going to be in effect. What you're what I think is actually what you're talking about is simply that as a being, we're a combination of many things. One, you could call it the ego, and that's the identity self. That's the one that says, I am, and I am not a part of everything, and I am me. This is my name. This is my job. This is what I do. And the ego likes to stay in the priority seat, you know, in the purview, in the the kind of captain's chair of our organism. Then there's the animal self, you know, what Freud would call the id, the primal urge, that drive, right? And that's our lust and it's our hunger and it's all these things. And our ego tries to keep that largely in check. But a lot of times that lust and that hunger will be driving and convincing the ego with that self-serving bias. Like, oh, no, 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 this is cool. This is a good idea. You should do this for sure. And you're like, yeah, it is. It's a great idea when it's really not a good idea. It's just your animal that's hungry. But the animal is also there to protect you and take over and you know, give you the fear signals when it's important and give you the adrenaline. And, you know, so that's a combination. The third factor is the soul, is consciousness, is awareness. You know, the soul has a lot of religious connotations, but if you just look at it as your consciousness, the one who's aware of the thinker, you know, the one who can analyze a thought as subject and object, giving yourself the space to really see that. Well, whatever is the one that is aware of the thinker, aware of the one who does the consciousness itself, perhaps you could elevate that, you know, to a soul that, that has more of a, a richer understanding, but either way, it doesn't matter. That's another aspect of who you are. So there's this combination, you know, Freud called that the superego, the one who watches. And so that's just one aspect, but I think there's an even higher expression of that, that you could call your higher self or your soul, but it's the same idea. The ego basically does not want to give up control. The ego wants to be the one in the captain's chair. And the ego knows inherently that these medicines threaten its position in the captain's chair, because at least temporarily, it's going to give way to that higher self. And that feels like death, you know, and all organisms, all beings, all entities don't want to die. And so when the ego gives up control or it has to change Whenever the ego is going to change, whenever your identity changes, it's a death. This is the story of the phoenix. This is burning to the ashes and getting reborn. And so a lot of the fear that people experience is the fear of the ego dying without the faith that at the end of the ashes, this new bird with even brighter feathers is going to emerge. And of course, the ego is going to return. It's not going to die. That's the phoenix. It dies temporarily only to be reborn as something even more beautiful. But it doesn't know that. It just doesn't want to die right now. You know, like imagine a bird that just really doesn't want to die. It maybe has heard the story about the phoenix, but it doesn't want to die right now because it's not sure. So to willingly go into its death with the faith that it's going to reemerge as a different bird, that's a lot to ask of the ego. So this fear is totally normal. And, uh, with experience, the more times you go into the fire and the more times you emerge, even, you know, more grounded, stronger and full of love and life and joy, the more times, you know, the more you trust it. Um, but for your first time, that's going to be the maximum fear because you've never proven this model before. You've never proven that if you go into the fire, what emerges will be the Phoenix. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Aubrey, I have to ask for our listeners who are maybe skeptical, but curious about like the 101, like a first time experience. 
what would you say to them? Like, what is like, what is the next step? Let's say you want to try to experience a spiritual awakening. What I do want to also acknowledge that I appreciate about this is the kind of cultural perceptions around this type of activity have been so stolen by the culture, right? Where it's, dude, we're going to do this thing together. When really what you're talking about (laughs) is an ancient tradition of spirituality that cultures, you know, large civilizations have embraced and explored. And I think it's important to make that distinction, but what would like the first step be for a me who's a married Christian from the Midwest who would never think about doing this? First steps. It's a great question. I think the first steps involve no psychedelic plants or drugs, period. It involves certain practices. And there's three practices that I would recommend. The first is sensory deprivation tanks or float tanks. So you go into, for people who don't understand what this is, they're, you know, they proliferated, they're all around the country. You go, you pay for a fee, like a little spa visit, and you go into a tank that's filled with like a thousand pounds of Epsom salt. It's exactly the same temperature as your skin. And you go in there and you float because of all the salt and it's completely dark. It's completely silent. And you're floating Terrified. in water that's the same temperature of your skin. It can trigger some claustrophobia for sure. You're floating, terrified. <laughs> in the dark, so, terrified. <laughs> uh-huh. But that would be the place for you to work on it. Because you know what? You get terrified there, push open the door. The light comes in. You can step out. And you can come in. You can float with a little bit of light coming in. You know, you can actually, you really have the ability, like the terror at any moment, you can say, okay, I'm done. Right. And that's Mm -hmm. a great way to practice where if you're in a five hour ayahuasca journey and you're like, oh shit, I'm terrified. I want out of here. Good luck. You buckle up. You got another five hours to go. There's nothing you can do. Right. So that's where the situations get really hard. So a great way to practice is with the float tank because you go in there, you surrender, And if you actually allow the experience to go forward, instead of feeling claustrophobic, like you're in this tank, you feel like you're in boundless space. And you will actually many times start to see different visions. And as your mind, your default mode network goes offline and your brain waves drop from beta, which is always analyzing and looking into alpha, which is more in the zone, clear thinking, Mm. and into theta, which is that deep meditative restful state, perhaps even all the way down into delta, which is normally typically dream state, You start to get in these states where you have access to this waking, dreaming consciousness, which is a great way to start. And also, if you are scared, a great way to do it, because there's no lasting effect. You end the experience at any moment. Mm -hmm. And that gives you this sense of confidence that, all right, I'm doing this. And regardless, it's going to be healthy for you. The very least, you get an Epsom salt bath. Good for your muscles. The magnesium absorbs through the skin. You're going to feel better at the end of this, right? Like, there's no, there's nothing to lose other than, you know, your 50 bucks or whatever it costs to go in there. If you just look, go in, dip your toes and you're like, I'm out. Yes, you may lose 50 bucks. But if you actually go with the experience, it can be incredibly valuable mm-hmm. and a great way to practice. So that's think, step one. Kev, didn't you do that once? I did. Did you like it? I did. Okay. All right. Second one, Aubrey. Second one, which takes you deeper would be shamanic breathing. So Stan Groff came up with a method called holotropic breathing, which is very kind of, uh, it's a little bit more structured, but the, the general category is called shamanic breathing. And this is a series of deep breaths. And this is something that's often best done guided as well. So you find a shamanic breathing practitioner or shamanic breathing experience. There's a great one out in, uh, in Sedona, the person who taught me how to hold this ritual, her name is Anahata and she runs, uh, shamangelic healing she calls it and she offers this incredible breath work and there's but there's many people who do and you start breathing deeply now i have to say when i first did this it was you know 11 years ago or so i was already 10 years into psychedelic medicine and i was like i'm gonna breathe like what what am we what are we talking about here like what am i even doing and i had an incredibly powerful experience because you go into this deep breathing deep breathing deep breathing And then you hold your breath in these breath locks. And what you experience is this deep somatic release. All of these emotions you didn't even know you had stored up start to come out. And I've been a part of, you know, dozens of these and actually started to lead some of these experiences with the Fit for Service Fellowship and other different groups. 
And I'm always blown away at the power of the breath to actually unlock really particularly a lot of the stored emotions that are in the body, people shaking, people releasing anger, people releasing sadness and tears, and sometimes finding like deep peace and visions. So uh, shamanic breathing would be the next step. And again, the beautiful part about shamanic breathing, you want the experience to end, just slow your breath down. That's it. Just slow your breath down. And the experience is done. Like there's nothing there's you're in you're you're absolutely in control with your foot on the gas or your foot on the brake. Foot on the gas, foot on the gas, breathe deeper, breathe faster. Foot on the brake, you know, slow down your breathing. That's it. It's and that's and that's a great way to learn and also, you know, has incredible depth to it. So I would recommend that as a second step. And then the third practice would be ecstatic dance. And this is another one of the great practices that I've really, really enjoyed. Did you say ecstatic again, dance? Correct. Okay. What is that? So if you look around the world, almost every indigenous culture has dance rituals, the sun dance, you know, all the drum circles, all the fire dances, all of these different experiences. And the idea is that when you're dancing, you can create a state called superfluidity, which is type of flow state where you collapse the mind and all there is, is there's music and then your body. And so there's mu music and movement and you're not thinking about it. You're not judging it because a, a, one of the big things that we have here in the West in particular is a lot of constriction and a lot of like, we're not even, even if we're dancing by ourselves, mm -hmm. we're judging how we're moving. You know, it's like, it's hard for a lot of people, even in a dark room all by themselves to play music and really move their body freely. But if you do that, not only does it release those patterns and those constrictions, but you can also get into this really trance-like meditative state. So there's ecstatic dance available all around the country. And I know for guys, this is like oftentimes, and some, and many women as well, this is one of the scariest things to think about. But you go in there and the lights are low. And the idea is not to look at anybody. The idea is to have absolutely your own experience. This is not an interact. This is not a dance party. This is just you moving fluidly and freely. And actually it gets ruined as soon as, and sometimes this happens, I have to acknowledge in containers that are not held in the public ecstatic dances, sometimes there'll be people that'll try to dance with you and you just politely kind of, you know, shut it down and stay in your own zone because this is about you just moving to music. But really you can do this on your own. If you put together a playlist and you actually just start moving. Now it's better when it's guided, when there's, you know, instructions. And, and this is one of the things that I lead. And I like to bring people through a journey, whether it's the hero's journey or whether it's a movement through the energy <laughs> centers of the body, finding different ways that you can kind of move and, and feel emotions. But in, again, it's another way to release stored emotions. You can go through visualizations once you get in that super fluidity and that state where all there is is music and movement and your mind is quiet. And then you can have really powerful visions. I've had some amazing visions from that. And Again, at any point, you can just lie down, sit down. You know, if you don't want to dance anymore, don't dance anymore. But ultimately, if you just dance for that, your body's going to feel great. You're going to get movement. You're going to break through these kind of patterns of restriction. It's just a win, 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 win all the way. All of these practices are like there's nothing about them. At the end of the day, either you're just getting Epsom salt, you're getting a bunch of oxygen into your blood, which is going to alkalize your blood and actually invigorate your body. And you're getting dance and movement. Like you have nothing to lose. You know, you're just, it's only just your own apprehension and your own resistance that you just have to push through, but it's going to be a win no matter what. So I would start with those three experiences. And then that's kind of like the baseline. And if someone's done all three of those and they're like, okay, I'm ready to take it further that's when we start talking about the potential medicine journeys. And that's going to be different for everybody. I have something to say. Okay. Kev, are you listening? Of course. Okay. So Aubrey, um, I think that you are mama bear's bed. I'm going to say what I mean now. So, I think that you are, so your company is all about human opti optimization, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you do day in and day out. 
you have an extremely successful company. It's a, um, what do they call it? The Fortune 500 company? Did I get, did I get that right? Inc. Yeah. 500. Yeah. Not quite Inc. Fortune Inc. 500. 500 Inc. 500. 500. Okay, fine. Yeah. You're very successful. That's my whole point. Okay. But you are the most well-rounded, successful person I feel I've gotten to talk to. Like you're not the alpha male, I want to be a billionaire, I'm going to work myself to the bone, kind of. Like you, you're you very different, and it just kind of all hit me in this yeah, like he's last 20, moment. 21st century success. Your 21st <laughs> you. century success, exactly. You are... You are the model that I think we need because I don't think I don't think there are many examples of success that we see that doesn't come with extreme um, extremes in terms of what you're putting in to what to get what you want. And I I already kind of feel your energy of what your daily life is like, and I feel a calm. I feel a joy. I feel like, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to, how to really like kind of eloquently put it like a Jeff Crane Graham would, but I feel something that is really needed, obviously, you know, for you to have a successful business doing this, but um, I'm really glad that we've been exposed to that. And obviously our mutual friend, Kristen Prouty was like, you need to talk to Aubrey. You need to know him. You need to know him. <laughs> And throughout this conversation, like I'm collecting all this stuff and I'm like, oh no, that's the kind of person that we need to, to really look at because you have a successful business, you have your philanthropy that you're involved with. And I want to know more about fit for service. Um, you have really practical ways at looking at things, but I feel like, and you can tell me if I'm crazy here, I know I'm not crazy. I'm wise. Deirdre Hay told me to stop saying that I am wise, um, <laughs> I feel like you have a great balance in your life. Yeah, that's that's really the goal. And the, the balance for me is not a balance of staying in a narrow band right in the center and not wavering. And I'm always this kind of placid in this placid zone where everything's always balanced. My balance is found by also touching the extremes. You know, like I'm I am capable of a blistering. 14, 16 hour workday, whether it's writing or hustling or doing this, I don't do it all the time because I know that the pendulum has to swing. If I'm burning that candle, that kind of very masculine, young energy candle of like going after it, taking care of everything. And my work capacity is very high. So I can accomplish a lot in those, those times. I know that there's going to be a, a big decompression period where my phone's off. All I'm doing is you know, resting, meditating, maybe going for a float, relaxing, you know, sitting out in the sun, going for a swim. Like I know that it has to swing back the other way. And conversely, you know, I'll go on one of these ayahuasca retreats and it'll be all spirituality and it'll be all, you know, surrendering and just processing and, and connecting to the divine. And that will be the whole week. I'm going to want to go home to all my homies and I'm going to want to play pickleball and basketball pickup games and you know, that first person that got, I got one guy who's, we always just go straight at it. I'm going to want to feel that first contact when he tries to drive to the hole and I'm just there playing defense. Like I want the balance of both, you know, and I want also my 40th birthday is coming up. I'm going to, I'm going to party. I'm going to party, you know, but I'm also then going to do all of the restorative healthy practices on the backside. I'm going to get an IV the next day you know, that has all the nutrients in it that I need. I'm going to, you know, rest and sleep and support my body with all the best food and all the best. So it's, it's a balance that I've cultivated that doesn't preclude me from the experiences at the edge. And that's really how I like to live my life. I love that. I love that. <laughs> me too. So cool. Honey, jump in. I know you have thoughts. Well, as I said, he's the 21st century level of success. I see so many guys hanging on to the 20th century version, and it's just not working. They're getting sick. They're falling apart. They're seeing the younger generation rebel against it, the Jeffs and the Kelseys who are saying, you know what, I think there's more to this than a 100-hour work week and trying to have X amount of material possessions. Um, 
but there is a balance to it. So I'm glad you said that, you know, because for me, I, I'm with you. Like, you know, I always say the beer tastes better the less you drink it. So meaning like when you can have that really cold beer or you can celebrate for your birthday, it's going to yep. mean far more to you. Mm-hmm. And you're right. The next day, boom, you you, put on, you get your IV and you get right yeah. back in the game. I think, you know, I'm more the regular guy version of you. I have a long way to go. I'm also older, so I'm still stuck in a lot of the 20th century ways. But I feel like, yeah, today's men, you know, it, there's a lesson here. But if I hope people, what you see is the masculinity in you is not gone. You're still an ass kicker. You still want to play basketball. I'm sure if I came at you, you could defend yourself pretty well looking at you. I mean, I just, <laughs> no, but I I, I, yeah. I, I I, think, yeah, it's it's a role model that um, is still ahead of itself. I think we're going to need probably two decades to get there, but you are the pioneer. And I, I think it's I, I think it's wonderful to see. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, the challenge for you, the continuing challenge is going to be how do you connect to the regular person. Um, but I can say as a guy, you know, you know, you, it's very aspirational to see you, but how do you connect your message and what you're doing, you know, to, to us? So we say, Hey, you know, I, wow, I can do that too. You know, cause you can. But I think for, you just you know, did. Yeah. Well, yeah, I do. I, but I've said, as I said, I think that's going to be his ongoing challenge. And that's uh, ultimately like the way that I look at myself in the, highest articulation in the best way that I could express in this life. It's a bridge. And there's a word for this in the Quechua language, which is a language that a lot of the ayahuasca shamans and and the people actually spoke. And the word is chakaruna and it's a bridge. And I see myself as a bridge that goes from absolutely everything that you would expect in the ordinary world, you know, materialism, hustling, grinding, you know, fighting for success, you know, all about, the, the physical satiation of all of your desires and all of that, just normal life, normal life, which I think is, is beautiful. I have no judgments against that all the way to the deepest, you know, spiritual surrender where you're just absolute oneness with the divine and with that source energy and then everything in between. And ultimately like what I try to, what I try my best to do is to say, I'm, I'm neither, I'm nothing. I'm a bridge between it. So whoever you are, whatever you're talking about, whether you're a stockbroker or whether you're a shaman, like I understand, you know, I'm that too. There's a, there's a saying in Sanskrit, Tatwa Masi, I am that too. There's nobody who can come to me and say like, I'm this. And I'll be like, oh, well, that's not me. I'm like, yeah, I'm that too. You know, I may not express in that way. I may not have made those same choices or have that exact same profession, but whatever energy you're bringing, whatever your goals and priorities are, like that's me too. You know, it's all the same. I'm also other things, you know, and so I'm, I'm trying my best to be the full spectrum of that. So that can help people wherever they are, be whatever they're coming to me at, whether they're a world champion fighter, which we work with a lot with on it. And I have on my podcast or whether they're a top physicist or whether they're a you know, spiritual leader. It's like, yeah, I understand. You know, like I get that. I have that energy too. Like that's a part of the bridge. The bridge encompasses the full spectrum of um of human expression and uh so that's you know ultimately what i hope you know people can identify with and um it's been it's been beautiful so far and i actually one of the things that i really look forward to is when i have a really tough time and this is i think something that my audience and my podcast listeners and people who read my newsletter and, and follow me when i have a tough time i actually get excited because then i know that i can share it and when I can share that tough time, there's so many people who are also having tough times and having mm-hmm. difficulties and struggles. So when I get my ass kicked or when I do something foolish, like let's say I lose my temper and I get angry or I get really depressed or I get you know, somehow thrown off or I make a really bad choice, the alchemy for me is great. Now I get to share that. And now anybody who's experiencing that can be like, oh, wow, Aubrey too. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Mm-hmm. I am and that that's, too. I think... That's a powerful thing. I love that. I am that too. Yeah, I think um, I think there's so much to learn in this. I I wrote down notes as we were going along. I was like, God, I really want you to expand on addictions to dramas and chaos and all of that. I thought that was so fascinating. But we've gone on so long, so we'll probably have to just do a part two 
Um, maybe when you're back from Costa Rica, we can hear about this experience. But um, before we go, I do want to know a little bit more about Fit for Service because you mentioned it a few times and um, and I want to know more. One thing that I had, a, I had a real clarifying moment. I went to do uh, a ritual, an initiation that comes from ancient Shavin. It's a 3,000-year-old tradition with the Wachuma cactus that I mentioned with Don Howard. And there was, I had about five people that I knew there, and there was about another 15 people that were strangers. And we went through this week-long initiation guided by a guided by a real master. And it was an ancient, ancient initiation, the Wachuma Masada, three different ceremonies, all relating to the lower world, middle world, upper world, all cultivated and harvested from, again, a, a deep tradition. At the end, all of us felt like brothers and sisters. It felt like we'd gone through we'd gone through something together that bonded us, you know, closer than we ever could have imagined. You know, all of our vulnerabilities, all of our truth, we were stripped away of all of the different avatars and the ways that we act and the ways that we project who we want people to see us as, and we were just stripped down to who we actually truly were, and the bonds that we were able to form were incredible. And I've experienced that in many different experiences, whether it was, you know, going and climbing frozen mountains with Wim Hof and a group of, you know, 10, 10 homies that we came mm -hmm. and we kind of didn't know each other that well. And at the end of that, after diving into frozen waterfalls and submerging under the ice and climbing, you know, these frozen mountain, Mount Schnischka in Poland, shirtless, and going through that together, helping each other out, we were bonded. And this is something that Sebastian Junger talks about in his book, Tribe, and it's this deep sense of community and belonging that's invaluable. So from these experiences, I realized I wanted to cultivate a group that yes, shared ideas. Yes. You know, was able like a traditional mastermind to help people with the different things that they might be stuck in, in business and romantic relationships and their own personal growth and their own health and their own everything, everything that, you know, could be helpful, but also went through rituals that could actually bond a tribe together. And so that's what it, that's what really came together with the idea being that we're doing this yes for community, but also to bring ourselves to a level where we're fit for service. It's something that Don Howard always said, in order to be of service, first you have to be fit for service. Mm -hmm. Like you can't pour out your cup of abundance unless your cup is full. So the idea is to make sure that our cup is full so that we can pour it out to the world, our family, whoever, in whatever way possible. So it's the Fit for Service Fellowship. And um, it's a year long, year long program. Some people stay in for multiple years. Some people just dip in for uh, a little bit of a shorter experience. The minimum is one trimester. So one four month period. Um, and we always keep it at the maximum 150, which is Dunbar's number, who is a um, sociologist who understood that anything over 150, it's difficult to really care about and really bond a group that's larger than that. So we keep it at that threshold. We go around to different places in the world and we go through these ritual initiations, whether that's the sweat lodge together, or whether it's the cold plunge together, or ecstatic dance or shamanic breathing, or we don't do psychedelics, but everything else that I mentioned um, we'll experience. And really what I've seen, you know, obviously I had this idea and what the actuality of it has just been so much more. I mean, the people, how they've all come together, how they've been there for each other, how they've supported through every different possible experience and how these friendships and these bonds are really lifelong that are forming because of that utilization of both initiation and, you know, community and the, the vulnerability and the, and the love that's been cultivated from that. So ultimately, you know, for me, I've done a lot of things, you know, New York Times bestselling book, that successful company on it, podcast, you know, a lot of these different things, but I've always felt like everything I've done hasn't been enough. And this has been something that's I've really been working on because I'll have this feeling like it's not enough because I feel so blessed. You know, I've had so much beautiful support in my life. I have so many talents and so many different things that I've just been gifted with that I had no say in. So part of that is this feeling like, I need to do more. I have to do more. I have to give back more and nothing has ever felt like enough. And that's been, that's been probably one of the harder things for me to work through in my life is just feeling like no matter what I do, it's not enough. My potential is always something a little bit more and I'm not reaching it. And finally at the last gathering we had for a fit for service in Sedona, 
I finished that and I watched this group of 150 people and I felt all of the healing that they went through. And I understand, and I could see how the ripples of that would just extend forever in all the people they touched. And, and I realized in this really like, you know, emotional moment that if I never did anything else, this was enough. And it was just, I finally got to take that wow. deep sigh and say, okay, if, if this was all I ever did, this was enough. This mattered. And uh, obviously there's a lot of other things too that I've done, but I could really feel it and I could really see it. Um, Aubrey, can I ask you a yeah, question? That's, you, that's fit for service. I ask one more question with regards to this. So you mentioning enough, enough, enough. All I um, hear from a lot of the younger like students that I work with is I don't feel like I'm enough. It's I'm never enough. You know, I'm not enough on any part of my life. And, you know, I love you went through this experience and now you're like, Hey, it's enough. So many of us, I mean, I would bet 90% of us, maybe even more don't feel like it's enough. And I know some of it's good to keep some hunger to keep going, but do you have any quick, is there any quick strategy to have someone out there get toward feeling enough? If that makes sense. The, the key thing is, is that a lot of times we identify our worth with what we do. So we reduce ourselves to the doing of our life. Like what have we done? But the most transformative thing that I've seen happen is people in their being. When someone is, when someone is being in, in, their, in their greatest capability, in their greatest capacity, being truly who they're capable of being just as, as a human being. Think of someone like Ram Dass, you know, the great spiritual teacher who recently passed. All of his doings were a natural emanation from his being. He wasn't really worried about what he was doing. Yeah, all right, there was a couple books that got published, you know, during the course of his life. There were some lectures, but really his priority was his being. And he shifted the world in a massively dramatic way. And the same with you look at someone like MLK or Gandhi or somebody like that. What they did was incredible, but they were only capable of doing what they did because it was a natural expression of who they were, of like of their being itself. So I think shifting the priority, and this is something I've really been focusing on, shifting the priority from what am I doing to who am I being and who am I becoming? Mm. Because once I am that person, then everything I do effortlessly will flow naturally from my being. So it's just shifting the priority and knowing that being is enough because naturally things will happen. You will do things. But if you put being as the priority, it's something that I think is really, really helpful rather than always working about worrying about, oh, how many people saw this post? How many people are downloading my podcast? How many of my friends, you know, have changed because of this advice I gave them in this book? Whatever, whatever the thing is, or how much money am I making? That's obviously the most reductive form of that. But, you know, shifting the priority to being versus doing, I think is probably the most important advice I could give. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And I think, God, I'm going to write that down and, and see that every day. Shift the priority. To being. Yeah, to being from doing. Amen. I love it. Aubrey, this was amazing. Um, I think <laughs> it's you. our longest episode maybe ever. <laughs> um, and I already wrote our next one. I wanted I wanted to do one on living to our full potential, but I feel like you just kind of gave us the, the cues to that at the end of this. Um, if you guys want to know more about Aubrey, you can go to aubreymarcus.com. We will link to that in the summary of this episode. Um, his book's Master Your Mind, Master Your Life, 12 Steps to Master Stress, Anxiety, Depression, Addiction, Anger, Trauma, and Fear um, is available probably on your website, right? Or wherever books are sold. Well, that one that one's still coming out. So that one's a pre-order. Oh. And then the book Own the Day, Own Your Life is the, the first um, one. Is the book that's already out. Yeah. And that's taking you through all of the optimization practices for a single day. Perfect. And then, of course, the Aubrey Marcus podcast is uh, in the health and fitness section of Apple Podcasts. So you check that out. We'll also link to that in here as well. Um, this was an amazing conversation. It was great. Thank, Thank you, you guys. so much. This is awesome. And I'm definitely going to be checking back in with you because I'm going through ayahuasca. I'm in. I'll be there. All right, I'm in let's too. go. I'm in too. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> happy I'm not kidding. To, happy I'm to not either. I'm, the best experience. I'm, I'm either. in, but I'm also terrified. 
right <laughs> still, but I'm, I'm more in than I ever was. I would have to do it and know that Kevin, I, I obviously I fully trust Tom, what we call, what, what, we, what do we call me in this house? Aubrey? disposable help. You send in the disposable <laughs> help. Let me go in. You Whatever happens, it. happens. Yeah, that's it. If we, I make it through, that's great. If not, oh, well, on to the next. Yeah, I know. Yeah. The oh, canary. Man. Maybe right. if I'm out there and uh, if I'm out there in LA, we can I can guide you through a breath work. And, I would uh, love that. Team love and whoever that. you want. Yeah. Oh, you know what? We should do. Um, we do workshops yes. once a month with our um, exclusive members. I think that would be really cool. I would love, love, love yeah, to do that. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Um, Awesome. Well, you have an amazing uh, experience in Costa Rica. I hope you enjoy I Arenal. Will. And by the way, we did start the show talking about um, cold showers because I know you're uh, a big fan of them. And Wim Hof has been on the show before and I love him. And so when you started talking about <laughs> him, I was like, oh my God, of course. Um, yep. So anyhow, um, we will have to uh, do another episode. And, and happy would- upcoming 40th. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. Um, I have one milestone. tip for cold showers. Yeah. There's a lot of resistance to cold showers. And I just figured this out. The way to do it, it's wintertime right now. It's really cold. Uh-huh. but So it's an advantage. You got a natural resource. The strategy is you just get your head in. So move your body back because the, the body is the most sensitive part for the cold. But if you just let the water hit the top of your head and then move down your face and you take six deep breaths, you know, ideally you'll be breathing beforehand, but if you just let the water hit your head and take six breaths, then your resistance to letting the water go all over your body will really diminish. So that's my latest. And I just figured this out this winter because it's, uh, it's really hard. You don't want it to touch like your armpits and down your back. It's even for me, who's had this practice for years, there's still a lot of resistance, but if I just let the water hit my head first, the resistance goes away. See, when I get in the shower and it's cold, I'm like, ah, ah. Exactly. That's exactly. my exactly. way. So I'm now, like, ee, 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 ooh, ooh, and Kevin just starts laughing at me. And then, and then yeah. you hear a, ah, when the hot oh, water comes. Yeah. <laughs> but Arby, I I mean, can I have a question on behalf of regular guy Fridays? <laughs> so, oh so I like, no, I like a hot shower because it uh, softens my beard. So I have an easier shave. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm going to do that, would I do a cold? If I wanted to just still have that, but then, do cold after, or if I did cold first, would maybe the hot shave not be good afterwards? Because is it better to have the cold stay with you the rest of the day or for the next few hours? It depends. There's a lot of benefit that you can get from what's called a contrast shower, which is switching from hot to cold. And you can do that either way. So a contrast shower is going to be great for circulation. You're going to get a lot of the benefits. The advantage of keeping yourself cold and leaving after the cold shower is that your mitochondria will actually, which is the energy centers of your body, will have to work harder to warm you up. So it's basically like a workout for your cellular energy. So the only thing you'll be missing is the mitochondrial activation of warming your own body up. But everything else, if you do a contrast shower, you're going to get all of the other benefits. So, so I might go hot I cold then. Get, If I go hot go, cold, yeah. that might work. Thank you. Totally. All right. Totally. I'm in. I love it. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Aubrey. And until next time. I'm looking forward to it. This is great. (laughs) All right. Take care. All right. Take care. All right. That was awesome. Wow. I was so zoned in the whole time. And Kev, I'm doing... Come on. We got to get Maria on board. I'm in. No, no. Let's not get Maria on board. You send us in as the troops (laughs) profess. I go first, not you, Kelsey. (laughs) Then we figure out... Kevin's going to come back. He's going to be like... I don't want anything to happen to you guys. This is what everybody's fears of this stuff is, right? No. So normal people's fears are, he's going to leave me. Right? So so Kevin goes in and he's like, yeah, I've really been thinking. We're really just better best friends. So crazy. I don't see that happening. No. You guys are in it too deep. I'm kidding. See, I'm here's kidding. what I have to say, though. You, he said to go with someone you trust. Literally, Kevin's the only person that I think I would ever do this with. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Except, you know, but the only thing is we were, when we were doing the Tomorrow Show, we were going to do, um, we were just going to do heroin. Oh, my God. Or LSD. <laughs> And the thing, Jesus. and that what we got afraid of, well, why, it, what Roxy was, my co-host Roxy Stryer was concerned about was that I would be too fatherly trying to make sure all of you guys were okay. And 100%. And probably wouldn't get the experience myself. That's so true. That's why I may have to send me in the first time alone. 
Uh, and then I come back to the village and, okay. and tell the rest of the villages. Uh, listen, on a side note, I have to say, I think he was really digging the concept of regular Fridays. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him react. Regular Guy Fridays. I, re- I, I think that... Maybe I, we have him guest. On Regular Guy Fridays? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you yes. never know. Uh, I, I am... Um, I really like... I really liked that conversation. Mm-hmm. A lot. He is such a calm presence yeah. yeah he's been here a few times i told kelsey two more lifetimes for me that's who i could be no boo you're gonna get ayahuasca and you're gonna be a totally different man i really like ayahuasca for you i think i had my version of ayahuasca with the brain tumor i had a lot of those kind of you nice. know find you yourself so, moments you still have so much anxiety okay Maria, that's though. fine but that's not what this is about it's yeah i it's think like, it is Okay, yes, but I don't want to puke. No, honey, honey, I'm not saying you need to do it. No, no, listen to me. Here's the thing I I wanted to, it was just a long interview, so we couldn't, but, you know, I've heard from the therapists I have worked with over the years that I've trusted that you've got to get under the hood, meaning Mm -hmm. you've got to get to your subconscious and your unconscious. That's what he was saying. Like, you can do 20 years of sitting on a couch three three days a week. Uh, And by the way, and 80% of the time, you know, you can find way, like tips to manage your like madness, but you don't. It's not really curative. Whereas if you do these techniques, and you guys do them on the show all the time, the a the the um the uh, EMDR and all mm-hmm. these, it, what they are doing is getting to your subconscious and your that's unconscious, true. and really that's what you have to do. And 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 you don't have to do ayahuasca. Like that's you know one way. But what, what he's saying and other people saying is we have to be open to these new gateways. And by the way, 21st century, along with you know his version of 20, which I'm seeing 21st century success, I will also tell you 21st century is going to be the century of mental health. You are going to see um, the, 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 what's not just going to come out of the pandemic. The pandemic will get the blame. But what, the way we've all been living the past 20 years, the phones, the way the phones have raised us and social media and stuff... I hate saying this, you guys. I take no pleasure in saying this, and I'm not joking. The suicide rates that are increasing, and not just with the pandemic, before the pandemic. If you look up, if you even Google right now, don't, because it's alarming. Just in women, the last 20 years, how high the suicide rate has gone up. What you're going to see, how high this is, it's going to go from where we've all gone you know, and we're, we're, what this has all come to. So it's so important that we're going to learn. We've got to learn these new techniques to start to try so and depressed. nip this in the bud. Well, no, but you've got, yeah, but you've got guys like this that, mm-hmm. you know, and, and other people on your show, Maria, that are coming and saying, hey, we have to look into alternative ways. And I'm, well, the reason I'm saying that is it's not any more a foo-foo kind of option. It's something you really need to, you, we need to need to be open to, mm-hmm. and and, mm-hmm. and and ayahuasca might be too aggressive for some people, but there's other things that are, are, are similar. I think the I liked his practical steps before, and I, I feel them. like those will be good for me because obviously, if I'm so terrified, there is <laughs> there's like a lot of work that needs to get done. That did, the tr- the the tumor did not heal the traumas of the the terror because I was thinking of. Um, while we were talking, there were so many, um, there were so many examples that were popping up of like just the sheer terror of you know of everything. Anyway, we had to wrap I, up this show. What if show. I we went and go. I was sober, Maria? Huh? What if I went and did not experience it, but was just next to you? Ooh, absolutely. That's the only way I will ever do it. Is if you're right there to like help me. I've said I want to go to Mars. I want to do all this stuff. I just need you there because then I know I feel safe. Like you'll fix whatever needs fixing. <laughs> you will make me feel safe. I will be fine. But you know, I, I just, I, I love, I love adventure. I have big cojones. I do. But I'm also, I, I yeah, you're my security blanket. So I just need to make sure you're around and then I'm good. I will maybe do this someday, but maybe not. Well, I don't know. All right, I'm going to do it. Then then I'll take Kelsey. Yeah. Then yeah. You. And, and I yeah. like, oh, by the way, you know what I like about Jeff? You know, Jeff, you know what? Jeff's good. Jeff was raised probably by healthy parents in a healthy community. And he's just like, yeah, that would be kind of cool. But I don't know. I'm kind of good. Like. You know, here's what's challenging having me. Having slow though, coffee and I, what's challenging me is I'm resistant to it, and that is something in and of itself too. 
You know, like there is something about the fact that I am so resistant to these ideas and I'm challenging myself to think critically about why. And, you I know, like that. I, I'm going to try ecstatic dance for sure. That's like a, the very Jeff Graham way to approach spirituality. <laughs> but I, um, it's the thing I love about the show again, just to get out of here is that it, we bring on such a wide swath of guests and it's up to our listeners to decide how they feel. Mm-hmm. I know no one's going to listen to this show and not be compelled. It was an amazing episode, but like, I know a number of our listeners who I predict are going to go different ways. Mm-hmm. And that's important work too. Think yeah. About I want to know, by the way, if you're listening to this, share yeah. with us and let us know what you're thinking now, mm-hmm. what you thought about ayahuasca, what you think now. Um, and where's the best way for them to share that with us? They can share on YouTube, YouTube under the kills. comments. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep, that's what I would say. You, you can do under Patreon, the comments, but listener. also you can tweet at us. You can sure. go, we'll, we'll be posting on Instagram. So you can comment you can in the Instagram. And by the way, in the Instagram, you should ask for their comments on this. So remember mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah. Guys, in the meantime, um, you can follow us uh, on Instagram at Better Together with Maria. By the way, if you haven't joined us on Patreon, click the link tree in my Instagram or on Better Together with Maria. Click, click, click join us. Um, you will get amazing workshops along with the ad free episodes and the extra episodes, but the, um, the workshops, um, are really, really key because you get access to these incredible people and their incredible talents, um, for a mere, you know, 10 or $20 a month. So please join us and become part of our, our deeper heel squad. We appreciate you guys. We love you guys. And we want to keep on growing together in 2021. Um, if you like today's episode, check out episode number 100 with entrepreneur and fitness crossover expert, Ed Milet, um, who's a blend of entrepreneurship, health advice, also kind of aligns with Aubrey's philosophies. I think you'll really like that. In the meantime, you can follow Jeff Crane Graham at Kelsmeyer2 and at Undergaro. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. <laughs>